My name is uh, Joshua Polachek. I am the cultural attaché for North India at the U.S. Embassy. We're based in the American Cultural Center in CP. Um, and I uh, apologize if you've heard this before, but uh, during this week there's the QRF Basarius Asian Global Governance Forum. And as part of that, the U.S. Embassy has decided to sponsor uh, several U.S. scholars to the forum, including uh, Professor Kupchin here. Um, and Professor Kupchin has been very generous in giving us uh, several hours as part of outside of the forum to participate in events like this. Um, he's a very eminent uh, scholar, both uh, with uh, Georgetown University as a professor in international relations and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. So we're very lucky that he has uh, agreed to give us some of his time. Um, but I just wanted to quickly reiterate that he, he is here as a guest of the U.S. Embassy, but as a private citizen. And so um, you will likely hear views from him that you would never hear from me as a representative of the administration. Uh, but that's part of the reason we want to have the full breadth of views uh, here uh, in India. So uh, if I'm last, uh, let's give a quick round of applause to Professor Kutcher. Let me just take a couple of minutes, thank Josh, and you know, again, welcome all of you for being here at short notice and just place these sort of subjects that we wanted to discuss this morning in some limited context, which is that uh, when I heard that Dr. Kupchin is going to be here, there were two themes that he was proposing to address in the course of his India visit. One was about the emerging powers and the nature of the power shift that is going on at the global level and how and where the emerging powers fit into this particular transition that is going on at this moment. And the second was about <coughs> adversarial relationships. How peace can break out, I think, is the way in which he had phrased it. And both these themes, if you have had a chance to read and see me, you know, are derived from a very, I would say, vast body of work. If I remember right, Charles, ten books, you know, nine Something books, like which <laughs> go back to the late 80s when he had his first volume on the Persian Gulf, right? Mm. And this was at a time when the Cold War was, you know, yet to unwind, as it were, or unspool. And from then to now, you know, he's looked at theory, he's looked at policy, and I think in that sense, when he said that he would also look at how peace breaks out, in the last 12 hours, literally, we exchanged mails at midnight. And I said, Charles, why don't you do a trapeze? Which is, this is a very informed group. You know, they are academics, analysts, diplomats, and people who have spent a lot of time looking at these issues. So should we raise the bar? and request you, first of all, to look at this transition. And I heard him yesterday at the American Center. He gave a terrific uh, talk on this whole issue. And link it with, in the emerging powers, China, India, Brazil, which you had touched upon yesterday. And look at the India-China dialogue and see you know, how you would formulate the possibility of peace breaking out or the lack thereof. And how this is going to impact the kind of transitions that you had referred to. If that's okay by you, you have all of 20 minutes and then I'll. Okay. You know, you'll have a very stimulating discussion, I can promise you. Mm -hmm. By the way, let me also introduce <coughs> Professor Varun Sani more formally. He's at JNU, as I said. Again, at very short notice, he agreed to be our lead discussant today. So, thank you very much. Sure. Please. Thanks uh, very much for uh, hosting and for putting this together on, on, on such a, a short notice. I guess none of us knew the, the movings of the lunar cycle, and, uh, uh, but I appreciate everyone uh, uh, rescheduling on such short notice. And also, uh, thanks to, uh, to Varun for agreeing to discuss. I will, I will try to be concise and, and relatively brief so that we have as much time as possible for uh, conversation, and I will uh, try to touch on the two, the two themes that were just laid out. One is to, pro to provide a, a, a kind of conceptual <coughs> formulation or framework for this moment in international history. Uh, and then second, to segue from that into the whole question of rapprochement and how to think about the, the larger relationships, China-U.S., China-India, India-U.S., uh, because obviously they're going to be central to whether uh, this 
coming transition occurs in a, in a smooth and, and peaceful way or whether it will be more disruptive. As far as the, the former issue goes, I, I think that the, everyone knows that the distribution of power in the world is changing in a geopolitically consequential way. And we can disagree about the numbers. We can disagree about whether we should be looking at aggregate GDP or whether we should be looking at per capita GDP and whether it should be purchasing power parity. But however you want to count it, if you look at the distribution of global power two or three decades ago and you compare it with where we are today and where we are headed, it's clear that this is a moment of change in the distribution of power in a way that we haven't seen for several hundred years. And I think that what we're about to, to pass through in historical terms is the, the closing of the era that opened in 1815. And I choose 1815 because that's the, the period when the Napoleonic Wars came to an end. And that period of peace in Europe allowed European great powers that had, through technological change, through intellectual change, through innovation, pulled ahead of the rest of the world and gone out largely to conquer the rest of the world. And so over the course of the 19th century, led by Britain and under the rubric of Pax Britannica, a globalized and independent, interdependent world took place. Uh, and then Pax Britannica ceded or uh, shifted into Pax Americana after World War II. And that period from 1815 until today has been one in which some agglomeration, some partnership among liberal Western democracies has been overseeing a globalized and interdependent world. What I think is happening today is that we're moving into a period in history in which that interdependent and globalized world will no longer be anchored by a particular geographic location or a particular political or ideological model. And that's simply because the era of material primacy that started in 1815 is now coming to an end. And that's simply because the West has gone from a peak of about 80% of GDP to today about 48%. And that's going to be headed down to something closer to 40%. And as a consequence, we're moving into a period of multipolarity. Now, it's going to take time. Economic multipolarity is going to arrive much sooner than military multipolarity because the gap between the United States and the rest of the world is much smaller, or much greater on the military front than it is on the economic front. But one thing that we know from history is when the pendulum swings economically, it swings militarily, it just takes a few decades to catch up. Right? But it can happen much quicker than we think. For example, most historians would point out that Pax Britannica reached its pinnacle in around 1870. And in 1870, when British admirals looked out at the world, they saw no serious contenders, no one that could challenge the naval primacy of the British Navy. When they looked out at the world 20 years later, it was vastly changed. And that's because the United States had ramped up its battle fleet. Tirpitz and the Kaiser had decided through the first and second German naval law to build a world-class battle fleet. The Japanese were building, the French were building, South Africa was in revolt. And so in the space of 20 years, the British had gone from sitting on the, on the top of Mount Everest with no one nearby to a world in which their primacy was slipping away. 20 years is not a long time in historical.
And so the, the, I think the, the challenge for us today is to recognize that we are entering a period in which geopolitical change will be as profound as it was in the 1870 to 1890 period, or yesterday I talked more about the 1700s as the period in which global power shifted from India and China to the north and to the west, largely to Europe and then North America. But this period of history, I think, will be one in which there is a profound historical change of that scope. And the question, I think, for people like us who, who think about diplomacy, think about statecraft, is how to pass through these next few decades and still preserve a rules-based international system. Because one of the great legacies of this era of Western hegemony is that we live in a rules-based international system. Getting a new distribution of power and a new rules-based system peacefully, by design rather than by default, is not going to be easy. And I think the dominant view in Washington and, and among some of my academic friends, let's say people like John Eikenberry or Henry Slaughter, you may have read some of their writings, is that Yes, the global distribution of power may be changing, but it doesn't matter because our order, this rules-based system, is being universalized. Everybody is going to play by our rules, and therefore the question of how to build a new rules-based system is irrelevant. I don't share that view. I think uh, when one looks at Russia, China, India, Brazil, and say, do these emerging powers want to accept the current rules as written and play by those rules, or are they interested in, to some extent, revising them? My answer is, they want to revise them. And it's not just China that wants to do so. China, I think, is in some ways uh, the, the country that will most significantly challenge those rules because it is not a liberal democracy, because it practices state capitalism, because it has a different view of rights than the West. But even when it comes to emerging democracies on issues such as sovereignty, legitimacy, global justice, responsibility to protect, the International Criminal Court. There are very different norms and very different rules that need to be taken into consideration. I will uh, leave it at that, and we can, we can talk more about that subject uh, in a few minutes and, and switch to the, the second uh, issue that uh, our chair put on the table, and that is a key determinant of our ability to move from one rules-based system to a new rules-based system is going to be relationships between the great powers. And I wrote a book in 2010 that was called How Enemies Become Friends, and that's a study of how peace breaks out. And in that book I look at 20 different historical cases of countries that move from being enemies to being friends without war. The cases include bilateral relationships such as US-UK, Norway-Sweden, Brazil-Argentina, Indonesia-Malaysia, and they look at multilateral cases, that is to say situations in which peace broke out within a grouping of states rather than bilaterally. And those cases include the European Union, the Iroquois Confederacy, which was a pact among five Iroquois tribes in what is today upstate New York that was brokered in 1850-51. 
1450 and lasted until the Revolutionary War, 1775, the United Arab Republic. And very briefly, after looking at those 20 cases, uh, I came up with the following model of how peace breaks out, how rapprochement works. And I identified essentially four phases. The first phase involves what I call a unilateral accommodation. And that is a situation in which one player, one of the countries involved, makes a bold step and an unambiguously bold step to indicate to its adversary that it is interested in trying to build a peaceful relationship. That opening move, that gambit, is motivated not by altruism, but by necessity. So for example, in the case of the United States and the United Kingdom, it was Britain that opened the door to peace. It did so in 1896 in response to a dispute that broke out between the United States and the UK over the border between British Guiana and Venezuela. And the United States, when that dispute broke out, sent a note to London that said, this dispute is occurring in the Western Hemisphere. By virtue of the Monroe Doctrine, it is occurring in our backyard. We therefore suggest that you submit this dispute to neutral arbitration. And Lord Salisbury gathered the cabinet together and he sent a note back to the United States that said, get lost. And the president then consulted with Congress and they started to prepare for war. And the British ambassador reported back to London that the United States was ready for war and Lord Salisbury gathered his cabinet together and he said, uh, we have a problem. And he consulted particularly with uh, the military commanders in Canada and the Royal Navy and the Admiralty said to him, we cannot go to war. We don't have the battleships. And therefore, we need to back down. And after careful thought, Lord Salisbury sent another note back to Washington and he said, after some reconsideration, we agree with you about this dispute. We will submit it to neutral arbitration. And Lord Balfour, who was the leader of the government in the House of Commons, gave a speech in which he said, we recognize the legitimacy of the Monroe Doctrine. And people in Washington thought that they were dreaming, hallucinating. They said, what the hell's going on here? But what they understood was that Britain had made a bold move to suggest they wanted to move the relationship with the United States in a different direction. It was unusual, it was unambiguous, it was a rapping of the knuckles on the glass. And it was correctly understood in Washington as intended by London. <coughs> Phase two involves reciprocal restraint, which is a period in which the two parties, or more parties if there are more parties, engage in testing to see whether the other party is genuinely interested in moving the relationship in a peaceful direction. And so this phase in the US-UK case lasted from roughly 1896 to 1898-1900, in which the US and the UK traded concessions on a host of issues, including fishing rights, the border between Maine and Canada, the border between Alaska and Canada, America's request to build and fortify the Panama Canal, naval balances in the Western Atlantic, 
And this succeeded in convincing both parties that <coughs> this rapprochement was not a, a one-time deal. It was something that was deepening and it was leading to a building momentum behind peaceful relations. The third phase is what I would call societal integration. <coughs> Phases one and two are very much the realm of high politics. It's the diplomats. And the diplomats oftentimes are engaging in these negotiations without public knowledge, because they have to. And that's because making peace with the enemy is very dangerous domestically. There are always opposition members waiting in the wind to jab the knife in. Right? Which is why I would say, to bring it to the present, Obama faces a more difficult task negotiating with Congress than he does negotiating with Tehran. Which is why the British government in 1898, 1899, 1900 faced as difficult a task with Parliament and the British public as it did with Washington. And that's because the British government was making friends with enemy number one, the United States. Nonetheless, what happens in this third phase is that the diplomats, the politicians, feel that they have made enough progress to begin to move this issue into the public domain. They give speeches. Pacts are formed. In the case of the US and the UK, the British American Chamber of Commerce was opened, and they flew the American flag next to the British flag. And before dinner, they would sing, God Save the Queen and Star Spangled Banner. In other words, they began to try to get normal people and businessmen and opinion writers and editors behind this building rapprochement. And then the final phase of, of, of it is a change in the narrative, the images that the two sides hold of one another. So in the US-UK relationship, it was around 1902, 1903, that the American president and the British prime minister started to give speeches in which they said, <coughs> war between the United States and the United Kingdom would be a civil war. It would be fratricide. It would be bloodshed within the family. And it, this change in narrative actually corresponds to the period in which the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom and the War Office in the United States began to actually tear up war plans and in which the United States was dropped from the two-power standard, which was the standard the British Navy used to set force levels. In other words, the Royal Navy stopped thinking about the United States as an enemy against which it needed to do force plan. And by 1906, the British had withdrawn their last troops from Canada and had essentially evacuated their battleships from the Atlantic and moved them to the North Sea and the Mediterranean because of the rising German threat. That, in a nutshell, is the same story that I found in all of the cases that I looked at. They all go through that sequence of four steps. Just a couple of uh, additional thoughts uh, on this issue. Number one, economic interdependence is irrelevant. I didn't expect to find that. In only one of the 20 cases that I looked at was economic integration important to political reconciliation. And that was the case of German unification in the 19th century. 
where the Zollverein, the customs union, the integration of Germany's different states cleared the way for German unification in 1871. In all the other cases, economic integration had no impact upon political reconciliation. In other words, it's the diplomacy stupid. It's not the economy. Second point, regime type mattered much less than I thought. I expected to find that democracies are good at making peace with each other and autocracies are not. That is not what I found. I found that autocracies make peace with each other, they make peace with democracies, and that the key is the ability of the parties in question to practice restraint and to move down this road in a reciprocal fashion. And doing that is not the exclusive provenance of democratic states. Finally, and I already alluded to this, the domestic politics of rapprochement is at least as difficult as the diplomacy. And in the cases that I looked at, where countries started down this path and failed to make it, it's not because the diplomats failed, it's because the diplomats were sabotaged by opponents at home. Either because they were nationalistic, and they accused the leaders, the diplomats, of committing treason by making peace with the enemy, or because there were vested interests, in many cases economic interests, that were threatened by the process of rapprochement. And they came in and they blocked it at home. <coughs> there are uh, lots of different implications for U.S., China, India, China, U.S., India. Um, I will end just by uh, hinting at, at some of them, and, uh, and then I'll turn it over to, the, to the discuss them. Uh, I think the first point I would make is that regime type matters less than many of us think, or many of us are led to believe by the so-called democratic peace literature. And I mean that in, in, in two respects. One is that I think the United States, the common view in the United States is that democracies will naturally find themselves aligned with each other from today until the end of time. And I think that that overstates the degree to which regime type is a good predictor of geopolitical alignment. And as I said, in the US and in, in India case, I think there are areas in terms of interests and in terms of norms where the United States and India are in alignment, and areas of norms and interests where we are not in alignment. And one of the challenges, I think, in bringing into being this special partnership that both of our governments have been talking about is keeping our expectations in realistic alignment with the areas of convergence as well as the areas of divergence. And the second point would be that with China, uh, I think there are uh, opportunities and, and dangers. I think one should not write off the prospects of rapprochement with China because it is a non-democracy. I think we should judge China by its behavior much more than its regime type. And there are good reasons on the behavioral front to be worried. But in terms of the ingredients of getting rapprochement and peaceful great power relations, I think the keys are reciprocal restraint, the readiness of the powers in question to practice the kinds of, uh, uh, of readiness to negotiate, to deal, to withhold power that I found to be the critical ingredients of peace in the 20 cases that I looked at. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. I think that's a great set of uh, opening remarks by Dr. Kapchan. What I will do is to now request uh, Professor Varun Sani to make his comments as we discuss it, and after that we have enough time. I'm sure we'll have a fairly uh, spirited engagement on the broad sort of formulation that Dr. Kapchan has advanced. Varun?
you know, I, I, th I think this is just this is really fantastic and, you know, uh, well worth dragging oneself out on a public holiday for. Um, um, I'm not going to say very much on the second part of what uh, Dr. Kupchun talked about. By the way, I'm delighted that the last two university degrees he earned are from the same place that I earned my last two university degrees. So, so that's, that's just nice. Uh, that's Oxford, right? Uh, well, in his case it is. So, yeah, I presume so in mine too. Um, I, I'm not going to say very much about the, the, the second half of his comments. Um, because I really think in some ways his work on sort of peace breaking out is pretty pretty much peerless. I mean, there, there isn't a lot of it there. And, uh, and you know, there's very much little, the very little that one can really add to, you know, his, two th his sort of book 2010 and what he sort of said right now. Uh, you know, just a couple of thoughts in the context of sort of India's own relationships. I mean, you know, somewhere out there, bold new leadership, generational change, uh, you know, these potentially do become factors, I should see. So I'm going to just really, you know, uh, duck out of the second half of sort of his comments and really, in a way, you know, m make some comments with regards to the first bit, which is this whole, you know, question about emerging powers and, uh, you know, uh, global change and the rest of it. Um, it seems to me that I think one of the questions that we probably need to focus on is to ask whether we are actually going through a process of power transition or uh, system transformation. Uh, in other words, we're still in, in, you know, it's an ongoing process. So, um, and you could really come up with two potentially very, very different answers. Uh, you know, is it just power transition, namely that fundamentally the system hasn't changed? And, you know, uh, the fundamental drivers, the rules, uh, you know, the norms, to some extent, uh, haven't changed. It's just that there are a new bunch of actors that are now in play. And that over time, you know, these actors will fundamentally play the same game. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, the sort of, uh, sort of thing that, you know, uh, he also alluded to. Or is there really something else going on here? That are we really seeing a fundamental change in the system itself? Uh, you know, driven perhaps by the fact that these new actors play by different rules and have, you know, adhere to different norms. But maybe just because uh, of something else that you know, uh, the sorts of pressures and problems that uh, we face today are just fundamentally different. Uh, you know, uh, global climate change, for example. Uh, you know, I mean. There are just a whole bunch of different issues out there, and that therefore the system itself uh, is sort of now changing. Or maybe, maybe you know, uh, we are at uh, a particular sort of crisis point with regards, perhaps, to global capitalism, uh, for instance. Uh, you know, maybe not. Maybe we will look back and see 2008 as being just another one of those blips in very long cycles, uh, or we may see it really, in some ways, as a critical reflection point. I don't think we still quite know the answer to those issues. But I think it is pretty important because depending on where analytically and even normatively you sort of, you know, plonk yourself, uh, you know, you really have in some ways a very different perspective, you have in some ways a very different understanding. So that's kind of the first kind of generic comment I wanted to make. A second uh, is really to sort of suggest that in a way uh, we see three different types of problems in a way. Uh, in the international system. Um, there are one set of problems that are really, in some ways, new problems. You know, I just talked about sort of, you know, uh, climate and environmental issues. Uh, you know, really new problems. Uh, a lot of them can't be dealt with, uh, you know, uh, with the old building blocks of sovereign territoriality. Uh, so we got to, in some ways, really think about fundamentally new ways of approaching those problems. Or they, they're just simply not going to, they're just not going to come up, yield any kind of reasonable solution. Uh, I think there are a certain second set of problems, which are old problems, but uh, now, you know, in some ways, crying for new solutions. Uh, and uh, you know, just to think about one of the top of my head, I think it's the, uh, you know, the global trading system. Uh, and it's an old problem, but uh, in a fundamental sense, we've got to now really think about new solutions to that problem, the old solutions just simply don't work. Uh, but I think there is a third set of problems as well, 
uh, which are old problems, old solutions, new actors. Um, you know, uh, and a lot of these sort of the issues that you know, classical issues that fall into the realist camp and that dominate the realist thinking, actually uh, are in this category. You know, um, uh, so we've got new new players. Uh, you know, you got but. Uh, you know, and fundamentally, the problems remain the same, uh, and fundamentally, the solutions don't seem to be different either. Now, as I see it, one of the problems is that we're living in a moment where we have all these problems together, and uh, you know, um, I think that it's extremely important for us to make a distinction uh, between rising powers and emerging powers. Uh, I do believe that these are fundamentally two different categories of states. Uh, what are emerging powers? Emerging powers, as I see them, are middle powers on the ascendant. Uh, you know, uh, namely, uh, these are states that uh, lack the system shaping capabilities of the great powers, but are too large to be ignored in any great power calculus. That's what a middle power is. But an emerging power is, you know, further on to that, really has signaled its intent that you know, civil is intent to acquire the capability and to play that system shaping role. Um, and for me, you know, quintessential emerging powers are sort of you know, uh, Brazil and India. Now, these countries, to me, I think best really fit into this uh, this box. China is different. China is a rising power, and as I see it, a rising power is a state that uh, may not potentially have a system shaping role tomorrow. It already has a ship system shaping role today. It's already fundamental to any, uh, any, any kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, systemic, uh, great power, regional, uh, or any other sort of uh, you know, level of analysis, frame of reference you choose, you choose to uh, sort of think of, uh, you know, remains already relevant, remains already a core, a core factor. I, I, you know, I, it's not just a semantic difference. I really believe that this, this is not just a difference of degree, but of kind. And so, you know, uh, emerging powers may, in due course, become rising powers. But I don't think Brazil and India have that, uh, that heft today. Uh, you know, if we were meeting a decade from now, uh, who knows what we'd be saying? But they do not today. And I think that's critical. You know, the, the rise of China sort of brings another thought to, uh, to me, which I'd also like to briefly share. Which is that you know what the rise of China has done is fundamentally altered uh, the map of Asia. Um, Asia was a continent; it's now becoming a region. And by that, what I mean is that the rise of China and the centrality of China ge geopolitically uh, means that its rise is now knitting all the regions within Asia into a single region. In other words, for the first time, really, we have a continent-wide security interdependence uh, across, across that landmass we call Asia, which we didn't so far. Uh, but the rise of China and simply the centrality of China in geopolitical terms has done that. Uh, in other words, a security analyst sitting in India today needs to start getting really serious about what's happening on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, you know, uh, because it's now, you know, uh, really in some ways a single interconnected system. Uh, and we're still in evolution there. But, but I think, but I think that, 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 that that's happening. And so, you know, uh, pretty soon a country like India is going to have to learn that it has to play the game uh, not just in Islamabad and Dhaka and Colombo, but it's got to play the game in Hanoi and it's got to play the game in Canberra. And it's got to play the game uh, you know, in Seoul and so on and so forth. Because this is, in fact, becoming one single region in terms of security interdependence. But what makes this uh, really, in some ways, problematic, as I see it, is that this shift that's taking place in the global, uh, you know, in, in a way, in the, in the center of gravity, in a way, of the, of the planet, the shift from the Euro-Atlantic to Asia-Pacific is taking, taking sort of, you know, changing what the central theater is, but changing that central theater uh, into a region that is really completely bereft of any institutional architecture. So we're moving from, from a region that was very rich in institutional architecture, 
uh, that had a regional integration process, the most vibrant regional integration process in the European Union. Uh, it had a military alliance in the form of the North Atlantic Treaty, but it also had a cooperative security architecture in the form of uh, the OSCE, uh, you know, uh, the whole Helsinki process and its uh, aftermath. And we're now finding ourselves moving into uh, a, a region that has none of them, uh, a region that's fundamentally fractured, that has some regional integrative processes of varying vitality and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but it's, it simply is, the Asia Pacific doesn't go here uh, in, any, in any sense, really. Uh, so, you know, uh, our chair was telling us that he's off to attend another meeting of CSCAP after a very long time, after a hiatus of a decade and a half or something like that, he was indicating to me. And we were just chatting over the phone and I was saying, well, you know, he said, it's Rip Van Winkle kind of thing. I and mean, I'll go back there and find, you know, uh, nothing's changed perhaps or whatever. What, what is CSCAP? Uh, CSCAP is... The Council for Security Cooperation in Asia Pacific. It started mm -hmm. after the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So we have four baskets and maritime is one of them. Yeah. So my point is the problems are the same. We are revisiting them after 20 years. No, I mean, I, and I think, I, think, I think it's just relevant in, in the context of my report, the remarks I'm making right now, because if you compare CSCAP with the CSC process, yes. Uh, and, no, and that, you cannot, you can't, I mean, you can't, no, no but, but, the, but, but the point is, we need to ask why uh, it was possible for the Euro-Atlantic in the midst of uh, 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 the Iron Curtain and bipolarity to be able to engage in that tortuous diplomacy that led after really years and years to the outcome that we see today. And an outcome, by the way, which was critical in my judgment to the soft landing of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet implosion took place, had that architecture not existed, I suspect that what we would have seen uh, would, would have been catastrophe on a global scale. But the fact that you know, the implosion of the Soviet Union was a soft landing was because that architecture existed. And we just simply don't have that here. Um, and that leads to another reflection, which is, um, that you know, different continents, it seems to me increasingly, are actually living in very different historical moments. Uh, and you know, in a, across Asia, you know, we're still living very much in a moment of historical modernity, you know, political modernity. And what I mean by that, you know, uh, is that in literally one sentence is that across Asia, we see the sovereign territorial state perfecting its sovereign territoriality. That that's the core political driver across Asia. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the grand obsessions of a country like China, its grand obsessions, Taiwan, Tibet, South China Sea Islands, are all about sovereign territoriality. Uh, you look at some of India's biggest obsessions, they're about sovereign territoriality. It come, it come to we, we're going to open this up and everybody's going to have a say, I'm sure. <laughs> and most of what I'm saying is probably doesn't amount to very much, but... Uh, it's true even of countries that you couldn't consider as having ever been colonized, that the colonizers, like Japan. Uh, you know, what's the core issue for Shinzo Abe? It's about the normalization of Japan. What do we mean by the normalization of Japan? It's about Japan becoming a normal, sovereign territorial state. So, so, I mean, I would, I would actually say that this is very much something that this continent is living. It's very different from the historical moment, the political moment that, that, that Europe uh, has, has lived and is going through. Uh, and I think we need to really understand that, that we can't more than, more than a certain amount read into uh, developments, you know, that are taking place in Europe and sort of extrapolate to what's here in the Asia Pacific. A word about Brazil, which we haven't talked about, although sort of obviously, uh, you know, over the years, Dr. Kupchin's done uh, a, a lot of work, uh, you know, where we sort of brought Brazil into the picture. I mean, as a, as a trained Latin Americanist, I sort of feel, you know, we need to sort of bring Brazil into the picture. Um, and I guess the, the thought here uh, is, are we going to have one integration project uh, in the Western Hemisphere or two? Uh, that's in some ways, it seems to me, one of the core questions. What the Brazilians are fundamentally saying is that there will not be a single integration project in the Western Hemisphere, which will obviously be led 
by the U.S. So it's going to be it's going to be at least two projects. Uh, if you look at institutional architecture, for example, uh, you've got the OAS, UNASUR. Uh, UNASUR is basically uh, you know the union of all the South American nations, and you've got something else now in the making called CELAC, uh, which may not amount to something, but my suspicion is that it's going to amount to something. And CELAC actually brings all the countries of the Western Hemisphere, other than uh, the United States and Canada, uh, under one roof for the first time. So it includes not just Spanish and Portuguese-speaking countries, but Dutch and English-speaking countries as well. Um, uh, and and it's, it's just really interesting to sort of look at this. You know, you, uh, m my feeling is uh, that uh, Brazil, in some ways, is more like Russia and China than it is like India when it comes to the question of the relative decline of the United States. Uh, you know, if you keep you bracket South Africa, keep it aside for a moment, you know, because South Africa doesn't really fit even in the BRICS. We could debate that. Um, it seems to me that you know you could make a statement that when it comes to China, Russia, and Brazil, the quicker the pace of the relative decline of the United States, the better it would be for them. I'm not so certain we can make that statement about India. Uh, you know, and so I, I you know, I, I, I really don't believe we can make that statement about India. And it may have something to do that in the Indian case. It's a question, it's a Hobson's choice between American global hegemony and Chinese continental hegemony. Uh, but it's just a thought. I mean, I'm sure I can be shot down on that. I've been told by the chair I have to wrap up, but just one final thought, um, which is that, you know, uh, thinking about the whole, uh, you know, Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, and all that stuff, I mean, we could, sitting in Delhi, come up with a different narrative, uh, you know. As they say, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, and, my, and my feeling is that, you know, sitting where we are, there are uh, two or three different drivers. One is, uh, one is the post-colonial impetus that uh, Ambassador Anubhi Ghosh just sort of made reference to. But you've got the sovereign impulse there as well. You've got kind of, kind of a realist driver there as well. Uh, all of them are going. You know, I, I remember I was I was actually in uh, in Albuquerque at Sandia Labs uh, when uh, the you know the uh, the the Chinese takeover of Hong Kong took place, and I decided to sit down and watch it sort of with uh, you know a couple of American colleagues at the live sort of ceremony on television, um, and uh, and I was just thrilled. I mean, you know, I, I'm surprised at my reaction, but I was just thrilled to see the British flag go down. And the Chinese flag go up. It's sort of as a political liberal, you know, I felt was bizarre on my part. You know, I mean, you know, I so I could see myself out there as a microcosm, you know, just like, you know, with emotions sort of clashing. And then my American colleagues just couldn't figure out why I, as an Indian, even from a realist point of view, uh, was was happy to see sort of you know the aggregate capabilities of China increasing. You know, I mean, it, it just didn't make sense to them. Uh, and that's the thing. That's where that whole different narrative comes in. But you know, if you Sitting in this part of the world, somehow that just signals one more, one more ele critical element in the end of an era. Um, and so I wonder whether you know now that we're talking about these new countries sort of emerging, we're going to have to start sort of thinking about their histories and their perspectives and how they view the world. Uh, and I think sometimes we may find curiously that you know Indian and Chinese perspectives are much closer uh, than you know we would otherwise expect them to be. I'm sorry I've carried on longer than I ought to, Chair, no but, but, thank I, you. but I'm done. Good luck, Chairs. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for coming from, uh, you know, from the heart of the U.S. Embassy. Um, and what I would like is uh, to, uh, if anyone has ideas about things like this that they would like to see, uh, we are very much open to suggestions from uh, groups like, uh, uh, like this. And, uh, we'll be working with the Commodore, but if uh, any of you um, as well, you can, uh, I'm happy to give people my cards and also, to, or, or to give Ramesh. Um, and so we're, we bring about 20 of these types of speakers on a wide variety of topics. They're not all geopolitical rebalancing strategies. Some of them are on topics such as uh, intellectual property rights or, um, or dealing with gender-based violence at the campus level. Um, so we do bring a wide variety of speakers, um, and we, we would seek to make sure that audience 
as like yourselves, who are our target audiences, are getting what you, you'd like to see out of it. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, please uh, um, approach me if you have ideas. And please uh, also uh, um, come to the American Library, because we do some of these events when we don't bring someone actually to India. Uh, we do a lot of video teleconferences with people uh, like Dr. Kupchin at the library, the American Center, uh, and cult American Cultural Center and Library. So um, thank you all again. OK, that's the last word to say. Thank you very much to Dr. Kupchin for answering these questions so patiently. All of you for being here. You know, Coming out on the holiday is something significant. I forgot to mention that Dr. Kupchin is ambidextrous. He's one of the few analysts who actually operates two laptops with either hand. So if any of you have any questions, queries, he's very quick on the email. So feel free. And we in the society, as always, would be very happy to take your comments. If you can write a 600-word piece, trying to so basically making the point that he's got it all wrong, please send it to us. We we'll hoist it, and we'll keep the debate alive. But on that note, Charles, many thanks. Many thanks. Thank you, Josh. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. And we'll do this again. Thank you. Thank you.